Thanks. But good morning. Nice to see everyone. I um, am going to start uh, by just talking about a program that our chamber is uh, is kicking off this year. Um, I'm going to ask Lori, since I got a little delayed there, trying to prepare myself to pull up what is now called our city to city tour. And this particular group is definitely who my target audience is. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about kind of our why behind having this program. Um, essentially, you know, gathering community stakeholders, uh, public officials, elected officials, and choosing a city that we aspire towards, if you will. Um, I'm kind of borrowing that name from the Tacoma Chamber because they've done these types of trips for a couple of years and have found um, extraordinary benefit from doing so. But uh, with the help of Justin Jones, who's on our board, also with Meredith Neal from the city of Puyallup, we've landed on the city of Gilbert, Arizona. And there's a number of reasons we've done that as our first city to city set of tour pick. Um, essentially, they've you know, moved themselves from what they were, were referred to as the hay capital of the, um, of the world to now finding it self-recognized as Phoenix's coolest suburb. So when we talk about, you know, our agricultural background and our fair, um, and then sort of what our vision is for our city to also be a hip and cool, um, you know, downtown economically vibrant core. Um, and this includes, you know, Sumner as well. Um, this just seems like a city that, you know, has admitted it took them 30 years to get there. Um, but their chamber is doing incredible work, um, working with the cities on a lot of this. Uh, in fact, the chamber CEO's father was the economic development director for a number of years. So she's put together quite a program for us, uh, a field trip, if you will, a tour of the city. They've got some great makers spaces, where, which are you know, really playing to, to what they can do a lot with their outdoor space. But you know, a number of us you know, have, have certainly grappled with what can we do with our you know, night market, our farmer's market folks, throughout the year that can really, you know, provide them an opportunity to showcase their wares and, and kind of create a cool vibe in our city. So I think they've done a really great job with things like that. Um, their education system is huge. Uh, they tour their teachers in their job sites. Um, I'd love to bring a program like that to Puyallup and Sumner, and I'll talk about the benefits um, more, you know, later about why that's so important to get the teachers in our community talking about all the different, uh, options of jobs that are in our area. But really it's, you know, we're, we're targeting hopefully about 25 of you to join us on this tour. Um, it's a Sunday through Wednesday schedule. Uh, we'll, you know, have a fun element. We'll have some dinners together. Um, actually all of our meals will be together. Um, but, you know, a tour, some panels, uh, panels on business and talent attraction. Uh, we'll have a transportation panel, a healthcare leadership and innovation panel. Um, so we're really excited about this sort of jam-packed couple of days and certainly hope that you um, will consider representing your organization with us. Sort of the unspoken benefit of it is, is definitely the relationships that you'll form traveling with these 20 other uh, stakeholders in the community. It's um, I, one of the reasons I feel I have a, a nice Rolodex of um, experts uh, different people to call on different issues. It has a lot to do with these types of trips um, where you really get to know somebody um, and, and you know, just exchange great thought leadership amongst yourselves. So you'll keep hearing about it, but I did want to just quickly un unveil it. Uh, Lori, if you want to show, there's also a landing page. I will send this flyer out to the group, um, but if you want to kind of poke around the landing page as well, um, we've got that on our website just for I guess, a quicker way to, to uncover a little bit more about what we're planning for it. So here you go, city to city, it's under our programs. Um, and then you can register. I think we have an early bird special if you're doing this before June. Um, there's a little bit more information about Gilbert as well on there. Um, but again, I, I hope it's something you'll consider joining us on. So that was to kick us off. Uh, today, we'll kind of go back to our Kind of our normal format where we're going to be hearing um, a little bit more in depth from our uh, city county officials i've asked team 25 to kick us off with just a wrap up of the legislative session 
let us know what's sort of still hanging out there. Where were we successful? Um, just to give everybody kind of an, an idea about that. We have Sean Egan from the port as well. So, um, and then if we have time at the end, we'd love to poke into any of you with your organizations and let us know what might be on your mind um, with government affairs this year. I know that amongst our board, uh, we've talked a lot about trying to get close to some of your industry lobbyists that I may not have had an opportunity to meet so that that's sort of an ongoing effort throughout the year, not just that rush um, during session to try to sign on to anything we can, but really, you know, meeting with your industry lobbyists throughout the year. So I'll, you know, do better the next few months to reach out to the folks that, that have a lobbyist within your association to try to set up some of those meetings. All right, without further ado, I'm not sure if I have my whole team 25 here or, or who would like to start. I see Representative Jacobson and Chambers. Um, so if, if it's not too early to kick it to you, I would love to do so. Welcome. Good morning. Thanks, Tara. You bet. I guess I should turn the camera right. <laughs> the, <laughs> sunshine is, the sunshine is so bright, it's hard to see here. <laughs> Cindy's here. Okay. I, I think Senator Gildon is joining us, but um, I'll, I'll kick us off and um, try to give you the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of uh, some things that happened this legislative session. And I'm um, happy to take your questions and Cindy, uh, you know, fill me in here as uh, I'll probably be bouncing around like a, a ping pong ball. <laughs> but uh, just uh, for introductions, I'm State Representative Kelly Chambers, representing the 25th Legislative District. Um, just finished uh, this my second term, uh, second two-year term, and uh, this was a short session this year, a 60-day session. So um, the legislature alternates every year. One year is a 105-day session, then a 60-day session, and on that short 60-day session, um, really they consider just the, the budget work we do a to be a supplemental budget. So kind of kind of some of the big themes this year is that there is a, a, a massive budget surplus. Um, we, every quarter, there is a, a forecasting council that's looking at revenues and it, what the state is expecting to receive in terms of tax revenue. And I think back in December, they were looking at a um, $11 billion surplus in, based on what they had previously forecasted and it ended up coming in even higher than that at $15 billion. So kind of the overall um, theme for the, the budget was uh, more money than expected, um, and uh, the budget that ended up being um, produced at the end spent all of that, in addition to um, raising uh, lots of fees on things. So with, within the legislature, there's, there's technically three budgets. There's the operating budget, which is the biggest one. There's the capital budget, which um, does a lot with uh, you know, construction projects and such. And then there's the transportation budget. So transportation like it sounds, deals with transportation. Uh, constitutionally, let's say the, the gas tax that you pay at the pump, that money is protected by the 18th Amendment, and that money is meant to be spent on uh, road maintenance, preservation, things having to do with actually, you know, running and operating our state uh, road system, which includes the uh, the ferries as part of our, our state system. So uh, <clears throat> going, going into session, one of our, you know, as, as members of the Republican caucus, one of our big priorities was to address uh, the governor's emergency powers. Um, you know, constitutionally, Washington is one of just a handful of states that um, in which the legislature does not have the authority to end an emergency. And here we are going into the third year of completely unchecked um, governor's emergency powers. And whether, you know, no matter what side of the aisle you fall on, you know, we think that is important that there be a system of checks and balances. And given that the COVID emergency really um, was not something anyone ever anticipated, we didn't have something built to our constitution in which that there, there was balance brought to this type of um, this type of situation. I think everyone, you know, living here where we do with the mountains and the sound, uh, we kind of thought that, you know, the type of emergency that Washington would most likely face would be an earthquake or tsunami or something, you know, of a, you know, natural disaster type event. So um, with what, you know, the entire world has dealt with for the last uh, three years with COVID, um, we don't have a, a, a piece to our con constitution, which allows the legislature to um, you know, have, have say in how long that emergency goes on. So there were several, you know, several proposals, uh, 
regarding emergency powers that were introduced both by Democrats and Republicans. And at the end, uh, we sometimes refer to them as the bills as vehicles, and some were reintroduced in the House and some were introduced in the Senate. And what you'll see with, um, with both chambers is that if, if uh, something were introduced in the Senate, maybe there were members in the House that said, oh, I'm going to add some of my ideas onto that Senate bill, and it kind of goes back and forth. Um, there was a, the, the bill that ended up being the vehicle that was moved to the floor for a vote um, had came out of the Senate. It was introduced by uh, Senator Emily Randall. She's from the 26th Legislative District over in Gig Harbor, Kitsap Peninsula. And um, it was a vehicle, it was moving, um, didn't quite have a lot of teeth to it because essentially, um, it, if you look back over the last three years, it would not have really netted any different result than what we've actually gone through, um, meaning that uh, all four corners, both the House and Democrat leadership and both the House and Senate would have to uh, agree uh, to, to end any emergency power. So um, the bill ended up being brought to a vote in the House at one o'clock in the morning. And, you know, we could guess about the reasons why that was done. Is it uh, to increase or decrease transparency and public involvement. Uh, at the end, you know, we're, uh, the, the, we had proposed some amendments to that particular bill that had came over from the Senate and debated the bill 20, 30 minutes, and then suddenly it was pulled down, not moved out for a vote, and we just moved on to voting on the next uh, bills on the list. So <clears throat> it really wasn't a uh, a meaningful product that was developed. It ended up, you know, dying there on the on the house, and the end result was session adjourned, and there were no uh, changes made to the the constitution or the law um, with regards to emergency powers. And I think for a lot of people, regardless of, of where your politics are, that having a system of actual fair checks and balances is, is important. And I don't think that we got there this session um, with with uh, what happened. Uh, you know, public safety has been that issue that, you know, for the last two years really been the forefront of a, of a lot of things. And, you know, last year the legislature passed uh, uh, some reforms to, called reforms to law enforcement. And as a result, we've just seen the headlines over and over again about how that is impacting our commu communities. Um, Car thefts are up 50% in Pierce County, catalytic converter thefts, you know, the, the ability of law enforcement to pursue vehicles, to um, affect an arrest, to use force. Um, a lot of those things changed last year. And, and we saw immediately uh, last July when those bills went into effect, just crime rights have just been skyrocketing everywhere. So there was a, a lot of bills put forward this session to reform the reforms, if you will. And we, there was a little bit of progress made there. Uh, I would say not quite enough, uh, you know, uh, so there were some, there were some, you know, good bipartisan bills that passed this session. And one of them was with regards to public safety and law enforcement and the ability to use um, military equipment and, uh, you know, 50 caliber ammunition or, uh, ammunition or greater. So what had been passed last year was like, like for example, law enforcement couldn't use, um, well, they could use bean bags, but they couldn't use the device to launch the bean bag at a suspect. So the, the, the fix that was done this year reinstitutes the ability to use that equipment to then use those devices. So uh, a little bit of movement was made on, on physical force, but the vehicular pursuit aspect of law enforcement has not been uh, corrected. And that's something that, well, gotta have some different folks in place if you wanna, if you wanna see that stuff, those items moved forward next session um, because there are some real differing opinions in the legislature on what the role of law enforcement is and, and how much authority we want them to have. So, um, and we've seen in our community story after story where you can watch somebody take your car right out of your driveway um, and law enforcement is not able to pursue those vehicles. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I stand with law enforcement that I would like to give them the, the tools to, to go after those, you know, people in our community that are making it unsafe for the rest of us to live here, making it unsafe to, uh, you know, 
just warm your car up in the morning or go to school, go to work. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Uh, there, there was, there was uh, you know, housing has been quite an issue. Uh, we, we definitely are short uh, housing supply. So there were, you know, there was uh, last session, there was a bill that passed that tripled the tax rate on larger housing developments, uh, larger construction projects. Um, the, the thing that went through this year was to reduce that real estate uh, excise tax for certain um, affordable housing projects. So it did help bring that piece back down. Um, but just in terms of the budget taxes in general, you know, we have had 10 plus years of uh, budget surpluses. And at what point, and you know, at some point, uh, we would like to be able to offer meaningful tax reform to, to Washingtonians. And we can do that in a variety of ways and, and several um, proposals have been, have been put forward, whether that tax relief be done through uh, sales tax exemptions, uh, sales tax reduction, property tax reductions. Um, I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, everything's on the table. Let's let's talk about something. But at some point, we have to return people's money back to them so they can afford to continue to live in Washington. And when you've had just record surplus after record surplus, he, the the money is there to to return some of that back to taxpayers, and we hear from them all all the time. Whether we return money to people at the pump so they can put gas in their car, or you know sales tax, so when they're at the cash register, um, you know so, some something has to be done. I think this is the um, probably one of the most significant issues here in the twenty fifth that we hear about when we're talking to people is you know um, is with regards to taxes. And um, even even you know Democrats had passed had a, some proposal for a in the House they passed a three day sales tax holiday over Labor Day weekend. So uh, we thought it would be helpful for parents, families, school shopping, a good time of year to even just give a three day tax relief. It passed out of the House in the end when the House and Senate were reconciling the, the budget bills. The whole thing was stripped out. So there really was no meaningful tax relief uh, passed this year. And that's that's unfortunate because the money was there to do so. Um, I'm running out of breath, Cindy. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's always great to work. 25th district <laughs> team. And so it's always great to work with Kelly. And that was a great update. We did spend our $15 billion surplus, including 1 billion of the unspent federal funds. And we did not provide tax relief as um, Kelly so aptly said. We even had, tax relief on diapers and you know when you're not financially doing very well and you have to buy these diapers and it would be great not to have sales tax on them but we stripped that we didn't but that was stripped out too the sales tax relief on diapers um it's it's just it makes me want to swear uh so we in the transportation budget we did raise a variety of fees we raised uh prices on licenses so if your license is about to be renewed get it renewed before i think it's june because um it's going to go up i think to 75 dollars from if, if you're <laughs> if you're one of the ladies going on the um the blue scarf society trip to uh to catch can and you need that enhanced driver's license uh get it now <laughs> yeah, the, exactly. I, you know with i think maybe well the the transportation budget was a Oh yeah, I don't want to swear either. It was it was a circus uh, <laughs> because initially that the the transportation budget that was proposed was importing a export tax. It, sorry, it was implementing export tax on fuel going outside of Washington. So this um, violates federal law and all the surrounding states, um, Oregon, Idaho. Uh, Alaska, we're all preparing to file lawsuits against Washington because Washington was going to tax those states in a way that was illegal and had never been done before. But the budget was built around the assumption of $2 billion in revenue from this new tax they were going to, to institute. So, you know, in, in the end, there's a, there's a, a smaller bucket within the transportation budget um, for construction projects that smaller cities and towns compete for grants to, to fund some of their infrastructure projects. And because they had to pull that $2 billion out of this um, revenue that they were going to get from taxing other states, they had to pull the money from some other place in the budget and they pulled it out of that 
the other bucket that funds local infrastructure tax pro or um, construction projects. So that is is tough because now those counties and cities that rely on those funds to do bigger projects um, are not going to have the money there to do that. But it but even though the budget did not technically implement a new gas tax, it raised every fee that you can that goes into just about every fee that goes into the transportation account. So aircraft fuel, license plate fees, uh, temporary dealer temporary permits, uh, driver's licenses and ID cards, administrative fees, you know, at driver, driving abstract fees. If you're an employer and you run a driving abstract on a potential employee, th those went up. Uh, auto dealer documentation fee, uh, stormwater transfer fees. It's all those things were increased within that transportation budget. These things were you probably never heard of, but you'll pay for it. Right. And and they did raid the Public Works Trust Fund, which was just unconscionable, in my opinion. Same with the operating budget. And both Kelly and I are on the Appropriations Committee, so we have a voice in the budget. But, you know, we're in the minority. So um, they even the Democratic state treasurer was concerned about the level of reserves we were leaving after we, you know, spent like drunken sailors. So there was that. Um, oh, the CARES Act. Everybody was concerned about the CARES Act going in because that would be a new payroll tax. We we postponed that 18 months. And so that was a victory, I guess, but that's still looming on the horizon. Um, so there's that. And, and, and we're the minority party and that's where Kelly and I are. We um, are ready to lead. We had a budget that did not raise any taxes and funded all our priorities. We had a transportation budget that uh, diverted revenue over from the general fund that would go for years and years. So. Um, we're ready to lead. We we did have a rough session. I was down there for eight days, uh, so that was exciting. I did get to go down to the Capitol, <laughs> so <laughs> Kelly was down there a little longer, but um, that was really instructive. Uh, we did, I was going to highlight Senate Bill 5722, uh, requiring more developments requiring development of requirements for clean buildings at the governor's request. And this could add a tremendous amount to building costs. So that's one to watch. Um, it's it's about the building code standards and the green green standards, and that's a bad one. So we're, we're hoping to do cleanup next time. As we did this time, we tried to clean up and tried to fix the police laws and we did some and didn't get emergency powers reform, nor did we get the police reform fixed. So, yeah, you know, there are a couple of good, you know, bipartisan things that passed um, well with law enforcement is um, 1785 uh, paying state patrol comparable wa comparable wages to to top top law law enforcement agencies. Uh, for some time, the state patrol has kind of been, I would say, a, a, a feeding feeding school that, that they get trained, the, the agency, you know, invests in those officers, trains them, and, and then they end up getting, uh, you know, picked up by other agencies that are, that are paying more money. So, you know, the state patrol needed to be competitive with their wages to attract and retain uh, law enforcement personnel. Uh, you know, and unfortunately, it, it, it's kind of counterproductive with some of the, the other policies that were passed, you know, last year with um, regards to public safety, because, I think many of our officers are um, feeling like they are not uh, appreciated and respected in Washington. And you com combine some of that with uh, the high cost of living here and other states are um, looking very attractive. We've had so many other states and agencies coming into Washington and literally setting up um, uh, uh, career fairs to, to uh, hire our law enforcement personnel out of Washington. I was at a conference back in end of November and, you know, uh, national conference, there were states from, from all across the country there. And they were all very thankful that uh, Washington was exporting its uh, highly uh, trained, experienced officers to the other states. They're, they're more than willing to take those officers if Washington is not um, going to be able to keep them. So that that's unfortunate because at the same time, we want to ensure that public safety is a priority. We want to make sure that um, law enforcement personnel are supported and, and that people are attracted to um, that as a career because we need um, people with a, a heart for service that, that care for their communities that are in those positions and, and going to uh, serve uh, Washingtonians well. So uh, it's trying to find that right balance um, in that conversation is really important. <clears throat> 
Uh, so a couple of, well, there, another, I would say, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, public safety, a, um, there was the magazine ban uh, bill that did pass. Um, this is something that, you know, as a supporter of the Second Amendment, which says um, that your uh, rights shall not be infringed upon, quite frankly, this bill just runs right over that and infringes upon uh, uh, your constitutionally protected right to to carry, and it's a it's called the high capacity magazine ban. But the term high is really um, I don't think used quite accurately or fairly. Uh, Ten rounds of ammunition in in a weapon, uh, maybe you know some some weapons carry 12, 15 rounds. That's how they're manufactured. Some carry less than that. But this bill would ban uh, the transfer sale any way you want to slice it and dice it of, of um, magazines that have more than 10 rounds of ammunition. And, you know, proponents of, of the bill say that it's, nobody needs more than 10 rounds of ammunition. Uh, and I, just to be perfectly blunt, I, I disagree. Uh, you know, if somebody were coming for you and your life, uh, coming for your family, are you confident that 10 rounds of ammunition would be enough to protect yourself, to protect your family and to protect your children? Um, my brother is alive because he had his weapon on him when he was attacked, not by one person, but by three men. He ended up shooting one of them to defend himself. And, um, you know, I just think if you're ever in that position where your life is on the line, I certainly, I, I certainly wouldn't want to have to have or need 11, you know, rounds of ammunition. Uh, and, and I think it was a, a step in the wrong direction to, to ban, to ban ammunition that way in Washington. So yeah, quite a the yeah. Kelly speech you can find on YouTube about that. If you want to stop Kelly a little bit, you can find her giving a, a pretty compelling speech against that bill. And, and we, we did some strategic maneuvers, like take a lot of time on certain bills because they had mismanaged their time and then they weren't able to get their bills in before House of Origin cut off, um, different things like that. We stopped a lot of bad nonsense, but um, we're really honestly hoping for um, a, a change in the balance next time. Yeah, and I, so, Tara, just let us know how much more time we have. Um, I thought I would just add maybe the, the riparian uh, bills. Um, there was a eight, House Bill 1838 was one that was proposed. Um, re, it's regarding state far, far, farmland and uh, riparian habitat for salmon. And what the bill would have done was any, any river stream area that ham, salmon uh, could possibly, or not even necessarily, not necessarily go to, um, 250 feet on either side of, of a stream, um, you wouldn't be able to farm that land. And those uh, landowners, farmers, would not be adequately compensated for the loss in, in productive land. It was something that the, the Farm Bureau farmers all across the state came out at just totally up in arms on this bill. Um, it's, a, it's a good thing that it ends up not passing, but I, I bring that up in context uh, to, to a bill that I had introduced, uh, the, the Voluntary Stewardship Program. And, you know, I, for, for me, the, uh, I'm not the, this is not my, my, my husband, I have a vineyard, but, you know, I'm not uh, farming next to a stream. So it's, 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 not as much my area of expertise as it is other people. So I would say if you want a really good speaker sometime, invite uh, Rosella Mosby, who's a uh, chair of the, the King Pierce Farm Bureau. But so you have this, this bill being introduced that would really impact farmers all across the state and their ability to produce the, the food that, that, that we need here and that we export here and that you know agriculture is such a huge part of, of Washington's economy. Um, a bill that I had introduced and uh, in, in contrast helps um, implement some of those same kind of land stewardship, land management policies, but on a voluntary basis instead of a mandatory kind of broad brush, one size fits all approach. And uh, it was unfortunate that that bill didn't end up getting passed out of the house because uh, the, the funding piece, I was able to get the funding for that bill that I had introduced, the voluntary stewardship program, got the funding into the budget, but then we weren't able to pass out the policy piece. And, and what had happened was about 10 years ago, the legislature passed this voluntary stewardship program. Counties could enroll in the program. 
uh, I think 26 or so, 27 counties in Washington of the 38 enrolled in the program. And now that they've seen some um, benefits from this voluntary stewardship program, more counties are on board with it, more counties want to participate. And Pierce County, previously was not in the program, wants to enroll in it. So we need to, to um, pass a policy piece that would allow those counties that had not previously participated to join into that voluntary program and, and be able to kind of on an individual unique case-by-case -case basis, look at their land, how they can um, uh, restore and maintain salmon habitat without requiring a one-size-fits-all approach to, to every landowner and their unique piece of property that they have. So that's something that I'll, I'll continue to work on. I know there are many other counties that, that um, would also like to participate in this as well. So important part farming piece uh, for our valley and, and the, the strong uh, tie we have here to a history of agriculture in Puyallup, so. All right, Tara, Tara questions? Yeah, so, yep, I just threw that in the chat. Anyone, I know Sarah, it looks like Sarah Joy has a question as well. I just, in building codes. Uh, Sarah, you're muted. I think Cindy just answered it. It's 572. Uh, and it just, I had heard, and I did not get this verified, that it's going to add 30K to the cost of, of you know, the housing units. I, I didn't get a verification on that. So that might be just be hyperbole, but it, it does add to the cost. And we passed another one um, along those lines. Um, uh, so, um, well, 1770, uh, updates the state energy code uh, in requiring new buildings must be net zero ready um, by at least 80% in annual at net energy consumption by 2034. And then there was House Bill 1280 requires all electric um, public in, in public facility design. Um, and so it, so it favors electricity over natural gas. When you require something like that and don't give options, um, in, in the building code, it, it does drive up the cost. And, and we know that the next, the next step is then to require that, you know, all home, all residential homes be built 100% um, electric and not use natural gas. And for, you know, particularly for folks that live in Eastern Washington, um, this is, um, they are not in favor of these kinds of these bills or, or, or limiting, particularly limiting a, a, residential home or even even commercial with one source of energy can be problematic if you're let's say you're requiring electricity and there's there's a there's a power outage do you have a secondary source of, of electricity and heat to fall back onto is is what some of the concerns are and for we know that that natural gas is is very affordable for for most people compared to electricity so eliminating them that ability to use that ends up driving up the the cost of heating your home for mm -hmm. your average family and you know when you apply that to the you know public facilities and commercial facilities it, it drives up the cost of those you know public works construction projects as well and and hello infrastructure and and i'm old enough to remember when we were shoving everybody into natural gas and all of a sudden now it's being demonized so i just i don't understand why we are so arrogant as to think that we can make these kinds of decisions at the legislative level instead of letting the market um, decide with us of course factoring for externalities like pollution and, and harms to the environment but it, it it boggles my mind i've been in appropriations where i've sat in a bill briefing and thought is this april fools are they kidding you know it, it's it's that difficult. <laughs> yeah, there was, uh, there was a, there was some good, uh, you know, bills passed out of the house that, that died over in the Senate. I wish they had, you know, gone all the way. Uh, Representative Rude from the 16th House Bill 1973 just introduced a bill that uh, school board meetings be recorded. And, you know, as um, in the legislature, you know, all of our public meetings are, are recorded and you go on TVW and watch those things. So, you know, it's hard sometimes when we're looking at um, legislation that would affect the entire state and affect those small school districts. But I think with the, you know, technology available today, everybody's got a cell phone and records on those devices. Can at least those um, school board meetings be recorded and, and, and publicly posted on a school district's website so that 
um, parents and families can see what is being discussed at school board meetings. Uh, that one passed out of the House, but did, didn't go all the way in the Senate. Uh, same thing, there was, a, there was another bill with regards to education that um, school districts post uh, curriculum materials and lessons online. Parents, I think in the last two years that kids have been um, doing school remotely and the classroom has come into the home, parents are seeing what their kids are working on and um, are, are more alert, more engaged about what is actually being taught in schools. And so an effort to, to get all that posted online to, and increase transparency there. Um, again, one of those things, good idea, but didn't make it all the way. And I think you'll continue to see uh, people work on that because you know we know from parents and families that this is a high priority for them. And we did we did find time to pass pickleball as the state sport. We a couple of good bills. Kelly and I real fast. <laughs> Kelly uh, was able to pass a wine license plate bill, which sounds kind of frivolous, but it's not really because it goes to tourism. So if I'm getting that right, and then I was happy to get past a bill or one bill about cosmetology license renewal from COVID, and another bill about um, when you have your registration in your car you can now tear off a portion with your home address on there. So you don't have to store your home address in your car um, with your car registration. So, you know, you take your victories where you can get them when you're in that far in the minority. So that was, I was proud of that bill. Well, gosh, we are just so fortunate to have the three of you on team 25, um, obviously always there to support you. Um, you know, once things are in motion, all we can ask this group to do is, is speak up show up, write letters, um, but something we can all more proactively do is get the right folks in office. So um, I guess with that vein and that in mind, I am you know, aware, thanks to, to Kelly on a couple of them, um, of a few seats and kind of critical seats that are coming available. And I know mo most of us live in the Puyallup Sumner area, so this may not be applicable to you, but you certainly may know someone. So I know one of the critical seats is in federal way, that's going to be coming up, right? Could could maybe either one of you talk a little bit about what seats you are a bit uh, aware are up? Well, the 28th, for sure. Um, that has always been in play. And remember we lost Senator Steve Ban last time and yes. so it all became all three Ds. Um, but the 28th is in play and they've got good candidates. They've got Victor Hogan and Susanna Kilman. Is that right, Kelly? Susanna uh, Kilman? Kyleman. <laughs> okay. Anyway. I want to put the L in a different spot every time I say her name. But, uh, <laughs> it, it, yeah. it, so check check out the 25th, 28th. Um, we, of course, Kelly and I will be running again, and, and it's our job to just, you know, make sure we nail that um, because we don't want to lose seats. Um, Better way, Jesse Johnson, who had sponsored a lot of that police reform stuff, is not running again. I don't know what our numbers look like there, but I think we should have people at the bus stop for every district because the bus might come because who knows what the voters are going to do this next time they're getting kind of angry is my feeling yeah there's there's uh, a, a lot of so okay so there's 49 legislative districts so two representatives and one senator from every district and there's just been a, a number of announcements of of people not returning there's oh there's six or eight members of the house that are running for the senate um so um opportunities open up there, but then there's also a number of people not returning and, and retiring. So, um, and, and kind of based on, you know, previous elections, you, you look at the numbers on those districts and, and kind of know whether there's going to be a competitive race there or not. If it's a, if it's a swing district, is there an opportunity to, to pick up some seats? Because I think at the end of the day, um, when there is more balance uh, brought back to the legislature in, in terms of very tight numbers or, you know, uh, very small leads, then, then you'll see less of this kind of really controversial, um, fringy stuff, like t totally, uh, um, nonsense. <laughs> the, the 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 police reforms that were passed last year these were these were not these are very controversial bills these were not um, broad bipartisan support bills and I think last year um, the Democrats thought they had a, a total mandate to to do whatever they wanted and and we saw the effects of that it was just immediate uh, spike in crime um, in in this across the state I think you know I grew up in Tacoma. 
and just and Tacoma's murder rate has returned to what it was in 1994, um, 30 years after um, the, coming off of that high murder rate. And I just recall all the work that had been done over the years to implement community, community policing and um, reduce crime and, and have more officers out on the street. And I just see that being eroded. And um, I think it really kind of comes back down to that balance of the legislature. And certainly as Republicans, we are um, ready to lead and would like to have the gavel and like to have those majorities so that we can um, bring some common sense back to um, the, the legislature. And in terms of our, you know, fiscal policies and, and um, not spending every dime, but um, being frugal with um, taxpayers' money, but also um, the, the, pol the, the, the social policies, the safety policies that, that are passed down there. So <clears throat> here in the 25th, of course, we want to hold on to and protect those seats. Um, the 26th, uh, interesting, you know, Gig Harbor, Key Peninsula, um, State Representative Jesse Young, who's in the House, is challenging uh, Emily Randall there in the Senate. Uh, so there is uh, uh, Hutch, Spencer Hutchins. I don't know if he's currently on P uh, Gig Harbor City Council or if he's previous uh, Gig Harbor City Council, but he's running for that seat there in the 26th, um, a, a race that, that, I, that I'm supporting. Uh, like Cindy mentioned, the 28th Legislative District just west of us, um, University Place, Lakewood. Um, both of the the House members there are, are being challenged and, and we just have some really outstanding um, can candidates there. Uh, Victor Hogan is challenging Mari Levitt, Levitt and uh, Susanna Kalman is challenging uh, the freshman Democrat uh, Bernoski. Um, both uh, of those Republican candidates are military veterans, um, stellar, stellar resumes and I, I would say, you know, check them out. But through the rest of the state, um, the 10th legislative district is a pretty, pretty contested, or in like a swing district that will be an interesting race. Uh, the 42nd up in Bellingham. <coughs> uh, I don't know if you saw, but Senator Doug Erickson that had uh, served you know 20 years in, in the legislature passed away. And so um, Simon Sefcik was appointed uh, youngest state senator in, in state history appointed to that position that that was vacated by Erickson's passing. And, and so um, right now, Sharon Shoemake, uh, who was elected the same time I was, she is uh, out of the 42nd, she is is running for that, that Senate seat in the 42nd. So some interesting races there, but a lot of long time, well, some, some kind of long time. Also time. Carmen Goers. In yeah, the, the, the 47. Yeah, yeah, and well, she's, she's gonna be a strong candidate. Re regardless, re again, regardless of party, uh, sometimes you have um, particular people that have certain issues that they're really um, stuck on or passionate about and, and allow or don't allow things. Uh, you have Eileen Cody that's announced her retirement and she has been in the legislature 25, 27 years, something like that. Uh, she's been the chair of health care, and um, uh, along with somebody like that leaving, there's they goes with them a lot of institutional knowledge, but things that they were hardcore about stopping that never had a chance of moving, maybe changes with the change in leadership. You know, at the same time, things that um, they championed may not be championed to the same degree when somebody different comes in and, and takes those those leadership positions. Um, also, in the 47th, um, sorry, uh, Democrat leadership, um, S S Sullivan, <laughs> Sullivan has announced his retirement. He actually wanted to retire uh, last year, um, they or last uh, term, but they kept him on one more term. And so you may have met uh, Carmen Goers. She is active in the government affairs um, with the chamber. And, and she is running for that position being vacated by, by Sullivan. So a lot of move, moving parts. I think sometimes, you know, people, if, if we're kind of focused here in, 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 in the Puyallup Sumner area and not looking at some of those other races, how those races wind up really impacts the amount of legislation that you see and those policies that come out of there. So I'd say you, you do have an interest in those races and um, uh, the, the results that happen there. So 
um, happy to talk to you more about how to change that. <laughs> <laughs> No, thank you so much. Um, that was a great recap. Um, you always bring the realness to it that we appreciate. Um, and again, I'll, I'll just stress again, we're very fortunate to have you. So thank you. Thanks for fighting the good fight. Um, Anytime. Awesome. I, I'll, I'll mention too, we through the chamber have started a 12 at 12, which is uh, once a month inviting 12 of our members, um, often some of our newer membership or folks that I just haven't had an opportunity to meet. And um, my ask at these lunches um, is, is to have these, these 12 stakeholders in our membership, I guess, more or less, let us know just what, what sort of pains you, what pains you at night, what are your points of grief, what's making business difficult for you. And uh, we are trying to do a very good job to collect that data. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly a lot of the obvious points, which has to do with crime, supply chain. Um, but we're, you know, we're finding some, un, you know, very interesting industry specific issues too. And it will be my goal by the end of the year to take these, you know, 100 plus interviews and, and have some good data to turn over to our county, city and state legislature, or, you know, representatives, um, just to see, you know, again, where we can plug in, where we can help. So just let, make sure we get those reports to you as well. All right. Who shall we move to next? Again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see uh, County Councilman Zeiger, I would love to hear from you, dressed up and ready to go today on your Tuesdays. Well, thank you, Tara. Good morning, everybody. And uh, I uh, appreciate the legislative updates there and was certainly following uh, the progress of the legislature closely. I think probably my, my biggest disappointment uh, is uh, the, the failure of the legislature to, to pass the uh, uh, the pursuit bill, the, the fix to the uh, pursuit law. And I think we're going to continue to see some real consequences for that when it comes to our county sheriff's department and, and for other law enforcement agencies throughout Pierce County. Um, you know, I wish there was a way to, uh, to really push for a, a special session to deal with that issue. I don't know that the votes are there in the Senate, um, but it, it's something that uh, I'm paying a lot of attention to. And uh, I know that our, our deputies are paying attention to, and, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of bad actors out there paying attention to that as well. Uh, if, if I could just go over briefly, I know we don't have a lot of time here, but I wanted to review some statistics here for Pierce County that I think are telling about the situation with public safety that we're looking at right now. Um, uh, when it comes to the category of homicide, uh, in 2019, there were 12 homicide victims in Pierce County. In 2020, there were 14. That number rose to 23. In, uh, in 2021, and as of uh, March 1st, there were 21, uh, just, just a, a couple of months into 2022, almost the same number that we saw in all of 2021. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, now that we're a few months into 2022, I think we're right around where we were for, for all of 2021, um, you know, more than, than uh, uh, double or roughly double what we were seeing just uh, in 2019. Uh, Commercial and business burglaries more than doubled from 82 in uh, January of 2021 to 170 in January of 2022. Stolen vehicles went from 398 in January 2021 to 905 in January 2022, so more than doubled. Armed robbery went from four in February 2021 to 19 in February 2022, so uh, more than uh, uh, quadrupled in the armed rob robbery category. Firearm involved crime, so that includes homicide, rape, assault, and robbery that's done with a firearm. Um, it was 16 in February of 2021, and uh, that, that number nearly tripled to 45 in February of 2022. We've also seen increases in aggravated assault, uh, shootings, drive-by shootings, um, and you know we could we could go on and on about some of the things that we're seeing out there and hearing about. We know about the catalytic converter theft that is just uh, just crazy out there. Um, at the same time that all of this is happening, and I think probably correlated somewhat to, to all of this happening, we now have 50 vacancies in our Pierce County Sheriff's Department. Uh, 50 vacancies, and and I, I am very worried that that number is only going to get higher as we look at people leaving Washington state to take uh, jobs in other, other states 
uh, there's very large uh, bonuses and, and pay packages that other uh, law enforcement agencies across the country are offering. We see more competitive packages being offered by cities here in Washington state, so lateral transfers, and we see a lot of people taking early retirements. And, um, and so, you know, the, the failure of the legislature, as I said, to uh, pass the, uh, the pursuit bill, I think is, is really problematic. What can we do at the county level? Do no harm. You know, let's not add additional burdens and, uh, um, uh, you know, let, let's, let's not make life harder for our law enforcement uh, officers doing their work. Uh, we should step up and provide a retention bonus. Our county executive has proposed $10,000 retention bonuses, and I hope that we're able to uh, take swift action on that in our supplemental budget that uh, we're going to be uh, uh, processing this month. And we need to invest in deputy wellness. We approved a wellness coordinator position in the sheriff's department um, in, in our last, this last budget that we approved. And uh, we also need, we need to add to that program. Um, we know that it's uh, so important for our deputies and for all law enforcement to uh, uh, you know, be in a good spot mentally, physically. Um, and so wellness is so important for us to invest in. And, and we need to advocate, we need to use our voice as county government to advocate for changes at the state level. Um, appreciate the, the fixes that were done on, uh, on the force bill and on the uh, uh, military weapons uh, uh, part of the uh, police reforms, but um, we need to advocate for that pursuit bill to, to be passed as soon as possible. So thank you, uh, Kelly and Cindy, for your efforts to, to try to make that happen this last session. And thanks for all, you have, all the other things you did during the session. Thank you, Tara. Well, that was depressing. I, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for the, uh, <laughs> yeah, not, not all great news, but I'll tell you what, the, people ask, what can you do? One of the things that I think needs to, to be done mm -hmm. is we need a lot of people uh, contacting local government people and saying, we value public safety. We value our law enforcement officers. Um, and uh, I was so inspired going to the service of Deputy Collada uh, to see just how many people turned out along that procession route to show their support to the Collada family and to, uh, to our law enforcement. And you know, hundreds and hundreds of people stretching from the fairgrounds all the way up 9th and then along uh, 39th, 112th. Um, you know, people of all ages, backgrounds, waving signs, uh, holding flags, and um, you know, there's there's people out there who support law enforcement. Yeah, so many people. And uh, but but I you know, for example, today is our weekly county council meeting at three o'clock. Would encourage folks to take the time on a Tuesday afternoon and, and during the open forum time at the end of our council meeting, just uh, spend two or three minutes commenting on the support that you have for law enforcement. I think that's so valuable. And um, Cindy and Tara are asking for those stats that I mentioned. Um, I, I'm gonna send those out in my email update later this week. So I'll get those compiled uh, that way. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I um, kind of, I think I want to interview you too for one of our, just to push some of this information out and figure out in what ways we can be more supportive or helpful in that effort. So I'll reach out to you on that Sounds one. good. Thanks, Tara. All right. Let's go to our city representatives that are on the phone today. I know we have Jeff Wilson from the city of Puyallup and uh, Mayor Hayden as well. I think she may have had to pop off to our meeting though. We'll see. Um, but yeah, Jeff, are you able to pop on and provide an update from Puella? Oh, I, I am. And I just uh, thank you for let me have a few moments. I'll just keep it keep it really brief. Um, <laughs> we're seeing a lot of really good positive uh, development activity that's occurring in the city. Uh, with the institution of our new online permitting system, we've seen a pickup in the number of uh, portal users, which means people are going in and using the system either to watch permits or to submit their permit applications. I mean, we're up over... First quarter of this year, we're about 600 registered users into the system. So that's, a, that's very good for starting off in January. A um, couple of major projects, projects that are kind of going on. There's a couple of new apartment buildings coming in, um, anywhere from that are in different stages from pre-application meetings to going through the review processes. Uh, we've got a 58 unit project that's being looked at on 43rd Avenue, um, about a 233 unit 
complex over 10 buildings up on South Hill. Um, then there's a, what's called the village co-op, kind of a senior living project that's up on 33rd or 39th, kind of across the street from Costco. Uh, speaking of Costco, they're also looking, or it's down the street from Costco. Costco is looking at doing a remodel on their site, uh, relocating their gas station, expanding that, putting in a car wash up there as well. Uh, so they're in the early stages of going through that process. Um, Kelp School District uh, completed their Kessler Center uh, last year, which was a great addition for them. And the medical uh, Latitude Medical Office building, which is up cl close to the hospital, that is nearing completion as well. Um, Sound Transit Parking Garage is getting, it's getting into different stages right now. It's, it's almost at that stage of being released from the contractor. To Sound Transit, there's still work that needs to be done before it can be open to the public but they're finishing off the major work on the, the, the structure itself. There's still offsite improvements that are needed uh, for signals and uh, safety, uh, safety improvements offsite that need to be completed before we can open that up for the public. Um, like I said, I wanted to kind of keep it really high level because I know you've got a lot of people on here, so I don't want to eat up a lot of your time, but there are many, many new large projects coming in of all different shapes and sizes. Uh, keeping us very busy. We're able to start doing some, we're, we're working, trying to staff up. Very, very competitive environment out there. and We're having a hard time finding bodies to apply for open positions that we have, but we're trying to staff up so we're able to keep up with the, the level of activity that's coming in and keep permits flowing and, and hitting our targets in terms of um, success in terms of processing. So that I'm happy to, to end it there and answer any questions you may have, or you can always reach me offline at any other time. Excellent. Well, thank you. And uh, it looks like we have Mayor Hayden. Are you popping back on? Mayor Hayden, did you hear? There you are. Let's get your mute on, off there and we can hear you. Sorry about that. I got a million things going. No worries. Just uh, just popping over real quick to see what's going on in Sumner. Oh, we're booming in Sumner. Um, we've got over 700 residential units on the schedule. Um, uh, our council just passed a, a senior package with affordable housing um, component, and they're working on a, a multifamily with affordable um, unit component and commercial building is is going like crazy um it, it's it's a good time in sumner i love it yep it's all good it. yes well i'm going to ask the very important question of miss nicole phillips that's on the line from sumner veterinary hospital is it still a very long wait to get your dog spayed because my I don't want to go through one more of those little <laughs> episodes with her. I missed the last one. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, I hope you can hear me. But we have hired uh, a few new veterinarians, so you will find that our wait times are much better. Uh, and during the week, <laughs> we are just kind of flying through the patients. And during the weekend is when everybody decides they do have an emergency. So. Yes, our wait times are better. And thank you so much for asking. <laughs> well, you guys are fantastic. And I, I do love, um, you know, you're a large facility. Uh, you, you show care for each pair, uh, pet and patient. Um, but I, yeah, I'm gonna see what the wait time is to get my little Gretel in. She's, oh, she needs to come back. <laughs> All right, well, anything else from anyone? If you wanna throw a question out, I, I appreciate everyone being here, Sean Egan. Um, anything from the port to report? No, since we're running late, I'll just keep, uh, I'll pass other than just say thank you to all of our lawmakers. Um, session requires a lot of work, a lot of time away from family. Even if you are doing it remotely, you're stuck off in an office somewhere or the basement online. So just thank you for all of your service. Yeah, appreciate that. Kelly? Thanks, Tara. Um, Council Member Zeiger um, 
giving the statistics on a catalytic converter theft and auto theft just reminded me of, of one piece that I thought important to share. Um, sometimes we do good work in the legislature that doesn't come out in terms of a, a house bill number. Um, but I, I think probably one of a, the biggest wins uh, this year was with regards to the auto theft task force. This is something that was created about 10 years ago. And when somebody gets a, a ticket, there's a $10 mandatory fee attached to that ticket that funding was supposed to go and fund the auto theft task force. But over the years, that money has been whittled away. So the task force was only getting $2.38 of the $10. And the money had been diverted to other things, Department of Corrections and youth prevention and stuff that really wasn't that tightly connected to, to auto theft. Um, so through a, a budget proviso, I was able to get, well, I got 4.5 million restored to that fund. It ended up through negotiation being um, brought down to 3.5 million, but that's 3.5 million for the statewide auto theft task force. So, and those are kind of broken up into to kind of like larger regional groups. So there's like the Puget Sound auto theft task force. Um, those types of crimes, auto theft, tend to cross jurisdictions. They tend to involve additional other crimes and they're more complex to, to investigate. But at least with that funding being restored in, in this budget, um, it supports law enforcement in a way that lets them do their job. And, and given that we've seen this you know, spike in auto thefts, it's just important and good timing to restore some of that funding so that they can um, go and do that job and you know, put us in charge and we will um, ensure that, that that money is protected, not continually whittled, whittled away at. So good win yeah. there. Yeah, I, I, those task force are really doing a great job. I just about every single car of somebody that I know personally um, has recovered them pretty quickly through that, just the advocacy of the local grassroots efforts created by those task force. So it's yeah. pretty cool. I'm glad it's being funded. All right. Well, always great to see all of you. Um, we'll uh, tune in next month. Uh, if there's a particular topic or person you want to hear from, always feel free to reach out to me and I'll do my best to get them on our meetings. But um, again, thanks so much. Have a great rest of your week. Team 25, we love you. Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Tara. You bet. Bye-bye.